Hello, and welcome to the AUA's all new monthly podcast series that focuses on leadership and business topics relevant to the entire urologic care team. Please join us each month on the Inside Tract as our subject matter experts explore various aspects of today's rapidly changing business environment. In this episode, Dr. Brad Lerner joins hosts Dr. Jennifer Miles Thomas as they delve into the topic of alternative compensation models, partnership, and private equity. Welcome to the AUA Inside Tract podcast. Today, we will be discussing alternative compensation models, partnership, and private equity. I am very excited to have with me today a true expert on this topic, Dr. Brad Lerner. Dr. Lerner is president of Chesapeake Urology Associates and the National ASC Medical Director for United Urology Group. In addition, he is the urologic consultant for the NFL's Baltimore Ravens. Welcome, Dr. Lerner. Oh, thank you. I'm very excited to be here. Well, perfect. Well, let's just set the stage for this discussion. Um, of course, physician compensation is always a conversation that people want to have, but there's not always the same available information. So let's provide our listeners for just a quick overview of physician compensation. No, I'd love to. I mean, you know, obviously, if there was the perfect compensation system, everyone would be using it. So mm-hmm. I mean, the general principles that we look for in physician compensation are that it should be fair and balanced. It should be financially sustainable. It should be transparent. You should be re- reward achieving and or exceeding clinical standards. You should reward achieving and or exceeding non-clinical qualitative standards, and then also if there's any physician administrative leadership efforts and duties, they should be rewarded as well. When you look at the basic components of compensation, there's the base salary, uh, there are benefits, and typically there's some type of productivity incentive or a bonus. There could be some type of you know non-clinical incentive or bonus as well. Uh, and there also could be some type of administrative stipend. When you look at the basic compensation models that are out there, there's basically five models that are out there, whether you're in academics, whether you're an independent private practice, whether you're in a multi-specialty group or managed care group, and they are as follows. There's salaried, which means you earn a designated amount regardless of productivity. They're shared, which means you earn the same amount regardless of productivity. There's productivity-based model, which means you earn a varying amount based on either the RVUs or the cash collections. There's a hybrid system, which means you earn a combination of an equal portion of a shared pool, typically with some type of threshold, and a varying amount based on productivity. And then there's a capitation model where you earn a fixed and pre-negotiated amount for each patient enrolled in a health plan for a certain period of time. Now, the basic pros and cons uh, of these models are as follows. So for salaried, uh, you know, there is a lower incentive to create a growing and long-lasting practice. Again, because you're earning the same amount regardless of productivity. As far as shared, this really doesn't account for varying levels of experience, skill, or work ethic, that you're gonna have physicians that you know, have a different levels of expertise and training, and uh, that you know, there won't be any variability as far as uh, their ability to earn compensation. There's the productivity model, uh, which a lot of people term as eat what you kill. This can lead to competition and disincentives for integrated care. And it's also difficult to retain certain specialists under this model, such as surgical oncology, reconstruction specialists, because they're the cases that they perform very time consuming. They're in the hospital and there's an extended period of time uh, uh, afterwards where the, the, um, you know, visits are not reimbursed. Uh, There's a hybrid system and a hybrid system again, includes a combination of a shared and productivity type model. It definitely promotes integrated care and supports specialization, but it can be much more complex to develop and manage uh, due to the intricacies involved. 
And then, then, then as far as capitation, that can really be dependent on the market and can fluctuate from year to year. What other aspects of, of these compensation models or compensation should they pay attention to? No, great question. So I typically put this into sort of two areas, like major benefits and, and minor benefits. So if you look at major benefits, obviously there's health care, which includes the medical plan, coverage for pharmacy, dental, and vision benefits. Uh, some practices will offer what's called a flexible spending account. Uh, where there'll be a medical reimbursement plan to pay for expenses that are not reimbursed through insurance. Uh, it's usually pre-tax and you either use it or you lose it. Uh, there can be life insurance. Typically, there's basic life insurance. It's usually term, which can be offered by the company. There also can be what's called voluntary insurance, which means that you can purchase insurance through the company for yourself or your spouse at a potentially discounted rate. There's disability insurance and there's short-term and long-term disability insurance. So short-term disability insurance usually begins after two weeks and that lasts up to 24 weeks. Long-term disability usually begins at six months and that continues until the normal social security retirement age. There's also a retirement plan or profit sharing plan and you know, so, a lot of plans have three components. There's the elective or the self contribution. There's the employer self harbor contribution or a match of a certain percentage. And then there's the employer profit sharing contribution to maximize the contributions. Uh, then there's also the malpractice insurance, uh, which is either going to be claims made or occurrence. Uh, you know, most most people will have what's called a one million three million uh, policy, which means that there'll be a payment of a maximum of one million dollars per occurrence, or three million dollars per year for claims. Then there's also the responsibility for tail coverage, which can either be the company's responsibility or the individual physician's responsibility. Uh, tail coverage usually costs about one and a half to two times what the regular coverage is. Uh, but it does, you know, protect you from any claims made from former patients. Uh, there's also what we call minor benefits or other benefits so for a new physician. It could be what's called a sign-on bonus that you would get for joining a practice. There are also going to be moving or relocation expenses, which, you know, are typically are reimbursable based on your actual expenses. There can be a car or phone allowance. Uh, there can be on-call stipends given, whether it's weekday, weekend, or holiday. Uh, there can be a CME stipend for continuing medical education. Obviously, there's other time off as well. Uh, there's vacation. You know, some some places have actually paid time off. Some some companies will offer loan assistance for for those that have significant uh, debt related to either college medical school or other graduate school, that there are some loan assistance programs. Uh, there's also are some private practice institutions that may offer some type of relationship with a credit union or a bank that could be helpful. Uh, and there also can be employee discounts. There are some organizations that have relationships with phone services like Verizon or gym memberships, things like that. And obviously the other thing to look at, which, uh, it, which you know, may be uh, changing with time is what, what's called family leave policy, which would include both maternity and paternity uh, leave aspects of that. Uh, when you sort of look at moving to sort of an associate to like a partnership, you know, uh, level, what, you, what needs to be looked at is, you know, how long will it take for you to become a partner? You know, what's the time interval? And that can vary whether you're a new physician versus an experienced physician relocating. Uh, what's the, the um, imp, you know, imperative related to board certification? You know, some, some places, in fact, most places likely would require you to be board certified to move on to a partnership track. And what are the expectations related to uh, productivity, related to RVU production? cash collections as well. And are there any expectations related to non-productivity based measures and citizenship? You know, there's typically going to be a change in structure and salary and benefits when you make a move from an associate to a partner. 
Uh, there may be a difference in how ancillary service revenue is going to be handled. Uh, there could be something called a buy-in or a buy-back if you happen to be uh, associated with a practice that may be, uh, have a relationship with private equity. There could be some type of an investment in the organization uh, that will be offered to you. You know, there's also the restrictive covenant and there's also termination criteria, which are looked at as well. What you just said is, is equally important. I think a lot of people, when they discuss physical compensation, they're just looking at maybe what someone's salary or would be on their K-1 if they're in a, a partnership. But what you just discussed was very important, the benefits. I think all of us kind of look for a good balance and a balance of quality of life. And so we have to consider just what we're bringing home as well as the additional benefits, whatever position may grant us. Well, let's kind of switch to something a little bit different. So everything that we were talking about, either with RVU, salaries, whether or not it's a it's a model that's based upon productivity, that's that's really fee for service. Now, how do like the ancillary services or designated health services kind of fit into these equations? Uh, so, you know, when we look at ancillary services, um, and it's typically related more to independent private practice and other entities, there is this increased ability to achieve a certain level of compensation related to access to certain ancillary services. The most common ancillary services are ambulatory surgery centers, there's clinical lab services or pathology, there's radiation therapy, uh, there's you know radiology or imaging, which typically includes ultrasound, CT, and or MRI. There's in-office dispensing of medication. There's infusion services. There's research and there's physical therapy. So those are the most common ancillary services. There's then this grouping of, of what's called designated health services, which are a group of health services designated under physician self-referral law or Stark law. And, you know, the Stark law applies only to physicians who refer Medicare and Medicaid patients for specific services to entities which they or immediate family member may have a financial relationship. So, you know, the, when we talked about the common ancillary services, clinical lab services, radiation therapy, uh, radiology and physical therapy all fall under this DHS sort of designation. So, uh, you know, as one sort of looks at, you know, ancillary service revenue distribution, uh, certainly we need to make sure that there's compliance with the regulations specifically to Stark laws. And these change as of January 1 of this year. And, you know, the basic tenet is that compensation should not be directly linked to utilization of services, i.e. the volume or value of their designated health service referrals. Well, that makes sense. And that's important to to review, too, as, as we, as a private groups, independent groups have ancillary services to make sure the distribution of those funds is, is appropriate. Okay, so what are the other aspects of employment that are really important for physicians to consider also? So sort of gloss over this briefly before. So, you know, other aspects that are important is there's something called a buy-in, which some groups still have. So a buy-in is really how much one is required to pay to become a part owner or an equity owner of a medical practice. Typically, it's based on three things, something called tangible assets, which is cash, furniture, equipment, items with any measurable cash value, what's called intangible assets, which are monies that are owed to the practice for services already rendered, which is accounts receivable and debt. And there's what's called goodwill, which is the value of the practice's expected future earnings power. Um, this is typically paid as either a salary reduction over a three to five year period or payment of a set amount over a period of years. And, you know, for those groups that may be a uh, uh, associated with private equity, typically this is forgiven in lieu of an option for investment in the uh, entity. There's also, if there's a buy-in, then, then, then on the back end, one would expect what's called a buyback provision, which is how much you would receive from the practice if it dissolves or if you decide to sell your shares, usually due to um, retirement, 
uh, maybe relocation or resignation. Typically, it's paid out over three to five years, and there typically is a tax deductible benefit for the company. Another area that's important is what's called a restrictive covenant. Uh, and, you know, the main aspect of that is what's called a non-compete clause, which it basically it precludes an outgoing doctor from setting up practice within a defined geographic distance, typically for one to two years after they depart. So, you know, again, this can be defined a lot of different ways, whether it's from your, your primary uh, uh, office or ambulatory surgery center or hospital that you're practicing. It could be any of those entities that are affiliated with the practice. Uh, you also need to be aware that if you're in a location that's close to other states, about whether this also includes crossing state lines or not. So you need to be aware of that. And the other thing is just being aware of, you know, what is listed in the termination clause of an agreement. Uh, typically, there is termination with cause or without cause. With cause, most people understand. You're convicted of a felony, you lose your license, you're un unable to perform your job in a competent manner. Without cause is typically at the discretion of the practice, and typically there's advance notice of, of more than 90 days. And actually, there, th there were an increased number of without cause terminations during COVID around the country as there were some practices that were sort of struggling um, with, um, uh, their, uh, uh, you know, revenue and, and their staffing and things like that, that uh, there was seen to be a little bit of uptick in that. Interesting. Well, I also know that you're an expert in, in private equity. So could you kind of provide some insight into the, the recent uptick in urology private equity investments, especially in private practices? So just to break it down to be pretty straightforward and simple. So why would someone or a practice consider it? When should it be considered? Who contacts who and what actually happens? No, great questions, uh, Jennifer. So, so obviously the first question is why? So first of all, why would a private equity firm want to engage with a urology practice? Uh, and typically, they're either looking to diversify their portfolio or they're looking for a return on investment. You know, why would a medical practice or urology practice look to potentially partner with a private equity firm? There's multiple reasons. They may be looking to improve their financial security. They want to, may want to make sure they can preserve their professional autonomy. They may want to serve a larger market, which they're unable to do on their own. They may want to expand their operational infrastructure as well as their ancillary services. And they may want to be able to provide more efficient care. Again, a lot of these things I just spoke about would have to be funded by the physicians where they may actually have to sign on to, to personal loans to sort of finance a lot of these entities. If you're partnered with private equity, then that's not, that's not the case. You know, as far as, you know, who contacts who, obviously a private equity firm can reach out to, um, you know, a physician or a physician group. It also could be a representative of what's called the management service organization. Obviously on the flip side, an individual physician or a physician group can reach out to a private equity firm uh, to make some inquiries as well. And there are some groups that actually hire their own investment banker uh, as they're going through that process. Uh, so, you know, so what actually takes place? Because I think there's a lot of uh, uh, lack of clarity out there as far as what actually happens here. So typically there'll be an initial acquisition of a large what's called a platform group. And, you know, this is a group that typically has a substantial community footprint uh, it may have, you know, multiple office locations, or ancillary services. Uh, it may have a, you know, significant market reach and has a strong reputation. A typical would be mature physician and administrative leadership uh, that that is already in place. Uh, there's typically an occurrence of an equity event where there might be some type of uh, payout to the physicians that are participating in that. And then what will happen is there's what's called a management service organization will be formed 
and they'll enter into what's called a management service agreement with the clinical entities, which is what maybe the, the medical group or the ambulatory surgery center division or things like that. Uh, and then a, as things move on, there may be further acquisition of solo, small and or large practices. And again, the purpose would be to expand the market reach. There can be decrease in cost. There can be scaling of administrative services. You know, instead of all the groups having their own accountant or lawyer or, you know, certain other administrative personnel, they can be shared among all the groups. And then there's also the ability to, to more aggressively uh, develop, uh, you know, a wide scope of ancillary services as well. And typically what will happen is there may be a resale of the expanded business to another investor in about three to seven years. And then the, the cycle tends to repeat itself. Uh, you know, as far as advantages or disadvantages, because obviously people say, why should I do it? Why shouldn't we do it? Things like that. So as far as advantages, you know, there's a you know, receipt of an upfront cash payment with an opportunity to reinvest a portion of this uh, as equity in the management service organization. Uh, you'd have better access to capital to invest in operational infrastructure in facilities and equipment and ancillary services. Uh, there should be an enhanced leverage in contract negotiations with payers and vendors, again, due to having a larger number of physicians and covering a lar larger uh, area. Uh, there could be mitigation and financial risk as actually individual physicians no longer have to personally guarantee the debt. You know, the debt is guaranteed by the you know, non-clinical entity, which is the, the MSO. There's the potential to diversify and grow revenue with acquisition of additional groups in the same or different geographic areas. Uh, there's also the ability to provide more efficient care due to improved operational and financial support. So those are all the, the, the main advantages. And so some people say, yeah, okay, well, what are the disadvantages? Well, there certainly are some disadvantages. Uh, and again, each group or individual has to sort of weigh advantages versus disadvantages. So what are the disadvantages? That while you are getting an upfront cash payment with an opportunity to invest a portion of this equity back into the company, typically there is a temporary reduction in physician salary, uh, which contributes to increasing the cash flow of the company. But there's certainly an opportunity to overcome this income loss with future growth. Uh, Obviously, the upside is shared with, you know, the MSO and the private equity partner. Not all the upside is shared among the physicians because there's typically a split of, of, of the gross profit that comes into the company. Uh, there can be a potential chain in operational control uh, as far as how the administrative and physician leadership is scaled throughout the organization. And there also may be a limited ability to relocate in the existing geographic area due to non-compete agreements. So that's uh, those are the basic disadvantages. Well, thank you. I mean, I think this is something that's very relevant to a lot of urologists now, just looking at the landscape and what's happening in the U.S. right now. And I think this overall conversation has been great. I think it's giving all of our listeners this great baseline understanding of, of what does it mean when we say physician compensation, what aspects should we pay attention to, what models are available, and what other things should be on our radar. And I think it also cleared up some of the, the process um, misinformation there may be out there about private equity and just what is the benefit? What is some of the risks? What are the advantages and the disadvantages? So I would really like to thank you for, for sharing your expertise and taking the time out of your busy day to, to share this with myself and all of our listeners. And I really want to thank all of our listeners for tuning in and to explore this very important topic. To listen to additional podcast episodes in this series that focus on the financial management aspects of clinical practice, please visit the AUA Inside Track podcast at auanet.org forward slash podcast. Thank you and have a great day. Thank you very much. Thank you for listening. For additional episodes in this podcast series, please visit the AUA Inside Tract podcast at auanet.org forward slash podcast. If you have any research focused on leadership, business, or practice management, 
please consider submitting your article to AUA's peer-reviewed journal, Urology Practice. For instructions for submission, please see auajournals.org and click on Urology Practice. This journal publishes cutting-edge articles on clinical trends, challenges, and practice applications in the four areas of business, health policy, the specialty, and patient care.